If you take a look at any and every very successful person, you will see that every single one of them takes extreme accountability for their life. When I say extreme accountability, I mean that anything and everything that happens in their life, they take accountability for. They failed, they take accountability for it. They succeeded, they take accountability for it. They hit their goals, that's their responsibility. They failed to hit their goals, that's their responsibility. These ultra successful people understand and live by this. Whenever these ultra successful people set goals in their life, they set goals in a way that is decisive and in a way that they know that they will achieve these goals. They know what plan they have. They know that they will succeed. They don't just say, I will try my best. I will see how the circumstances present themselves. They say, these are my goals. I am going to achieve them. I plan on achieving them. And here is my plan. Here is my deadline. Compare that with the narrative of the average person. The average person almost always seems to have a victim mentality. Whenever they set their goal to something, number one, they don't necessarily have a definite goal. And number two, whenever they do, they say things like, I'll try my best. I'll see what I can do. Let's see if the circumstances align in my favor. They never seem to have definite plans and goals. All their plans almost always seem to be up in the air. There's nothing that's solid and concrete about their goals. So let me give you a few examples to illustrate my point. So I just finished reading The 10X Rule by Grant Cardone recently. I love this book. And in the book, one of the chapters was dedicated to take control of everything in your life and to take accountability. The author was talking about how one time the electricity went out in his neighborhood due to some heat wave, some storm, some transformer failed, something like that. Now, although that happened and although it wasn't his fault that that happened, he still found a way to take accountability and to take charge. Here's what he said. Although the power went out, I have to take accountability because it's my fault that I don't have a backup generator. And because of that, the food can go bad in my refrigerator and I won't be able to take care of my family. If the food goes bad in the refrigerator, that's hundreds of dollars right there. Now, someone might counter that and say, oh, but it's so expensive to have a generator. Generators are way too expensive. Not exactly. When you calculate the cost of the food that you have to take out, on top of that, the cost of other things and taking care of your family and being in a state of fear and being in a victim's mentality and being at the mercy of your town fixing the electricity issue, then you're in a state of non-resourcefulness. And I thought this was a great example because this happened to my own family just 10 years ago when Hurricane Sandy hit us here in New York. So when Hurricane Sandy hit us, we were out of electricity for like five days. It was, I think, one of the worst hurricanes to ever hit New York, at least as of recently. And so we didn't have power and it was also kind of cold in the house. However, me and my family got lucky because one of my uncles, he did have a backup generator and his house didn't lose power because he didn't lose power in his neighborhood. He still had electricity in his neighborhood. And so because of that, we were able to use the generator luckily because he wasn't using it. And then I thought to myself, had we not had this generator, chances are we probably had to throw out all the food in the fridge, which is hundreds of dollars. We would have been freezing to go to sleep. We probably would have gotten sick. And so when you ask yourself, what makes more sense to have a backup generator to invest in that a couple hundred dollars, a nice generator, or to be at the mercy of the circumstances whenever things like this happen. So I thought that was a great example by Grant Cardone. Another great example of assuming control for everything and taking accountability is the example of the famous tennis coach, Richard Williams. Richard Williams was the father of Serena and Venus Williams, which are world-class tennis players, just in case you don't know. Now this man became ultra successful and the reason why he became ultra successful was because he assumed this type of control and accountability for everything in his life. Now just as a backstory, before Serena and Venus Williams were even born, he wrote an 80 page plan to make both of them tennis world champions before they were even born. How crazy is that? And so he started training them at a very young age. I think it was like five years old. And so it took him years to start training them little by little. And then eventually after years of training, he eventually believed that they had what it takes to become world-class champions and to compete internationally with elite level players. And so he had to go through so much shit to make this happen. He had to train them in an unsafe city, the city of Compton, California, which is notoriously unsafe. I think if I'm not mistaken, it's one of the least safe cities in the country. He had to do that. Sometimes he would hear gunshots in the background as he was training his two daughters. Imagine having to go through that just so that they became champions. There was even one instance where there were thugs around the area where they were training and then oftentimes they would call him names and just try to get him to react and they were dealing drugs. And one time when he was confronting one of those thugs, so they called him a bad name and so he started fighting with them and eventually he got hurt so bad 
they fought him and they knocked out some of his teeth, I think. And he ended up being really, really badly hurt. He had to go through this and he took charge for all of this just to make both of his daughters world-class tennis champions. And guess what else he had to go through? After training his daughters for years and really believing that they had what it took to compete internationally with champions elite level competition, he ended up going to one of the world-class tennis coaches in California in some really rich country club. He went and then he spoke to the tennis coach as he was warming up for training. When he told him, the coach, seeing both of his daughters play, he said he wasn't interested. The coach said he wasn't interested. And then he said, I just need a few minutes of your time, coach. Just please look at them. They're really good players. I'm sorry, I'm busy. We're warming up. He asked again, and then the coach aggressively told him, please, I'm not interested. And in the end, he just told him, all I need from you is a couple of minutes. I need you to see how good my daughters can play. They're really good. Eventually, he was like, all right, let's give it a couple of minutes. He gave it a couple of minutes, and then he noticed that both his daughters were really, really good. He was impressed. Imagine being a world-class tennis coach, being impressed by two very young players that you don't even know, and they're underage at that. Now that's just part of the story and then there's way more to the story. But long story short, that tennis coach ended up training Venus Williams who eventually became a champion. Now there's much more to the story and I really recommend you watch the movie King Richard, the one starring Will Smith. It's an amazing movie and it's one of my favorite movies because it's so inspirational and it's based on the true story that I just told you part of. Now I give you this example of Richard Williams to show you how much accountability and control over his life he took just because he had that goal in mind. He had to train his daughters. The environment for training my daughters wasn't safe, doesn't matter. We'll train anyway and I'll protect my daughters. The weather was horrible, doesn't matter. We have to train. Thugs beat him up, doesn't matter. We'll continue to train. The sport is a sport that's mainly white people and not for black people, doesn't matter. We'll continue to train. The tennis coach, that world-class tennis coach was reluctant to give Mr. Williams even just a few minutes to see how good his daughters will play. Doesn't matter, I'm gonna show him how good they are. I'm gonna keep pushing until he gives in so I can show him how good my daughters are and eventually he can choose at least one of them to train her and to make her a professional and elite international champion. And the rest is history. You see how much accountability he assumed? I want you to compare that with the average person. Had the average person gone through that, they would have given up at the first sight of trouble. The weather was bad, all right, we can't play. The thugs beat me up, all right, no more tennis. The coach couldn't see my daughter's potential, oh God, why me? Now those are just some of the many excuses we would have heard from people who lack accountability and control. Now I have a personal example myself of how I assume and take responsibility and control over my life. Now just as a backstory, growing up, I didn't exactly grow up in a situation or environment that was perfect or ideal for me to turn out to be self-confident, but I did anyway. So just as a backstory, for some strange reason, my parents always had a bit of a tough time understanding me. And so there was a big communication gap between me and my parents up until I was about 21 years old. This was actually with both of my parents, especially my dad, for some strange reason. So we moved to Egypt when I was 11 years old, my entire family, me, my parents, and my brothers. And then when I was in Egypt at that age, there were tutors who came to our house almost every weekday, either four or five weekdays per week to teach us subjects like math, science, Arabic, French, and sometimes social studies. And so sometimes what would happen is, although these tutors thought I was a smart student, according to my parents, that's what, they, that's what my parents told me, sometimes I wouldn't understand what these tutors are trying to explain to me. Not because I'm dumb, but because some of these tutors didn't have the best teaching skills. And so because of that, those sometimes that happened, the tutor would complain to my parents that I'm not paying attention. And I would tell my parents, this is actually not the case. I'm not getting what they're saying because they can't explain it well enough. And so no matter what I told my parents, they just wouldn't believe me for whatever reason. Now I tell you the story not to get you to feel bad for me. I tell you the story because I'm trying to show you how difficult it was at that age to actually be confident. So this is what actually created the big communication gap between me and my parents up until I was about 20 or 21 years old. And this is what led me to be very emotionally distant to them. And unfortunately, these insecurities were with me until I was about 21 years old because I was driven mostly by fear and partially by confidence, but mostly fear. Confidence, luckily, due to the fact that these tutors said I was a smart kid, but fear due to the fact that my parents did not believe me and there was so much stress on me to perform well in my exams and getting good scores, blah, blah, blah. It's like every time I tell my parents my scores, for example, I got a 90 or a 91, they won't be impressed because they're like, you could do better than that. 
Now, although this story isn't exactly a positive story, there is a positive about it. The positive is I had to make myself self-confident and make myself self-reliant. I didn't get that from my parents. I didn't get that from friends, family, neighbors. I got that from myself. I noticed that my parents weren't fueling me with the kind of confidence that they needed to, not because they were bad people, but because they didn't know better. And so this insecurity carried on to me from that age up until my late teens, early 20s to like 21, 20 or 21. And so I started assuming control and taking responsibility and accountability for my life from that point. I started telling myself that all of these things have to do with me being successful because I have to be successful for myself, not for anyone else. Now, I'm not exactly telling these stories to get you to throw a pity party for me or to feel bad for me. Actually, I am super grateful for these experiences because if it weren't for these experiences, I wouldn't have assumed accountability and took control for everything that's going on in my life. The people who know me on a personal level know that I'm very hard on myself. I'd way much rather be harder on myself than easy on myself. And the reason why I'm hard on myself is because I expect a lot out of myself. Because now, because of those experiences, I now take control over my life. I'm now in the driver's seat. I now get to call the shots. I now tell myself where I need to go. I now have definite plans. I take action to achieve those plans in a spirit of confidence. I don't say things like, oh, I'm going to try my best. Let's see what happens. For the most part, I take those actions with the end goal in mind, knowing that I will achieve my goal. My plan is to achieve so-and-so. My plan is to achieve X, Y, and Z, and I know I will achieve it. I'm in the driver's seat, and I'm the one who is responsible for my circumstances in my life, and no one else is, and no other situation is, regardless of my past. Now, from these stories and examples, I hope you understand the importance of taking extreme accountability and control over everything and anything that happens in your life, regardless of whether it's good or bad. Now I wanna ask you a question, and I want you to be completely honest with me. Which group do you belong to? The group that takes extreme accountability for their actions, or the group that falls victim to the circumstances that happen to them? Only you know the answer.